Um, so let's say you want to interface with Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever social network. Um, but you have a problem because third-party interfaces in general are hard. Uh, lots of reasons for this. Just a few uh, are that uh, they are slow. It is so much slower to call an external service than anything that you have internally, uh, even the uh, hard disk that Eric was showing last presentation. Uh, but users don't understand this, right? They want results right now. Um, they can see their friends instantly on Facebook. Why can't they see them on your site? Why are you slowing down what they're trying to do? Uh, another problem is that uh, third parties always have rate limits. These vary widely from one service to another. There are all kinds of weird corner cases and rules. And some don't even publish their rate limits, like Facebook. So you have to deal with them reactively rather than proactively. Uh, this causes a lot of problems. Uh, instability, um, yes, even Facebook goes down. So you have to deal with outages. Uh, you have to deal with random failures, 500s, 503s, fail whales, uh, all the kinds of stuff. Um, that in your internal system you work really hard to work around, uh, you are confronted with them head on in third party uh, interfaces. Uh, so luckily, um, there is a really great tool um, built for the Python community, first integrated in Django, then split off called Celery. Um, it is a uh, um, distributed task queue, essentially. Uh, and so you have chosen to use Celery because it is asynchronous, which means that you don't have to do all of your third-party interactions within the request response cycle. Uh, it's distributed, so you can spin up pools of workers as you need them, shut them down when you don't need them anymore. Uh, it's fault tolerant, it has um, retry built in as a feature. Um, you can fail safely and still uh, maintain your normal workflow. But now you have two problems. Uh, actually, much more than two up there. But these are all design problems that come with dealing with distributed systems. Uh, and Celery is no stranger to these kinds of problems. Before we dive into um, each of these design issues, uh, you'll, you may notice throughout the course of this presentation that I have pretty strong opinions uh, about what you should and should not be doing uh, with Celery and how you should do it. Um, you can feel free to trust me at my word, or you can you know, uh, grow me later. But uh, one thing I will say up front Always use RapidMQ as your broker. Never use RapidMQ as your results store. Uh, you will be so much happier if you just follow these rules. Um, RapidMQ has uh, ACK uh, support. Um, it has uh, you know, built-in um, exchanges and queue bindings and all kinds of routing features in it. It is meant to be used as a message queue, unlike Redis and all those others, other backends that Celery supports. Uh, RabbitMQ, however, is a terrible result store because as soon as you ask for the result once, it's gone and you can never ask for it again. Uh, so if you have a distributed um, system that's checking for when things are done, one place asks for it, it says, uh, yeah, I'm done, or no, I'm not done yet. You ask for it again somewhere else, and what task? I don't have a task. That is not what you want from a result store. It should store the result. OK, so let's get on to organization. You want to try to make your tasks small and as atomic as possible. Um, the idea here is that workers are ephemeral units. Uh, you should be able to kill them at will, spin them up at will, uh, and you get much better distribution from small tasks. Um, you can spread them out better, parallelize them, uh, and you should preferably only make one third-party call per task. If you have more than one API call, um, say you burn through the first two, you fail in the third one, you now have essentially uh, lost two calls from your rate limit with no effective work done, uh, provided that you need that third to complete your task. If you separate them all uh, and use a dispatcher to call each one uh, either in series or parallel, then you keep each stage of your work as you go along, and you get, like I said, better distribution. You want to try to keep task arguments uh, to a minimal state. A um, lot of uh, reasons for this. but. Uh, for instance, um, model instances, you should pass the PK of the model rather than the model instance. Um, Celery is actually serializing that full model instance, sending it up to your broker and back down to the workers. Uh, you don't know how long that's going to take. And in the meantime, you could have deployed new code that has a migration say. So now your model uh, instance state is out of sync uh, with the actual uh, model definition in your code base. Lots of bad things can happen. So. You will avoid all of this, and you will minimize the size of your messages, which means less memory overhead and faster message passing if you only use uh, minimal state in your message definitions. Um, you should defer data access to the task itself, um, again, for the same reason, because uh, you don't want a lot of information going over the queue. Um, like I said, it increases performance, and it prevents serialization synchronization issues. 
So let's look at an example task. Uh, this is a bad example. Uh, it passes in a model instance, as I said not to do. It makes several API calls in series in the same task. And when it tries to save the model instance at the end of the task, uh, you could blow up here, um, as I've mentioned, um, because you are now working with a deserialized instance of a model whose state is completely undefined in relation to the database that you're working with. Instead, if you pass in the model PK, you can avoid uh, any race conditions by retrying if you get a do not or does not exist exception. Um, this is actually good. It helps you maintain uh, reality with your database. Um, and then you can use your task as a dispatcher for several API calls and get them all done in parallel. So um, as much as Celery tries to hide it from you on the surface, tasks are classes. You may define a function, but as soon as you decorate that function, you've made it into an instance of uh, a subclass of task. Um, so uh, tasks are just classes. Don't be afraid to subclass them yourself and make abstract parent task classes to encapsulate common functionality that you need for a lot of your tasks. Uh, so if you were to take, uh, say, this task as an example, uh, it does a lot of boilerplate stuff that you'll find that you're going to do over and over again between different API calls, uh, for this, uh, in this instance, to Twitter. Instead, if you make an abstract uh, task-based class and you wrap all that function up uh, in, you know, say, an API call function, and then you just return the result of whatever your client were to give you, then you can make a subclass of that, take away a lot of that boilerplate, and just use that API call function over and over again. Um, that has other benefits that we'll cover later. The final uh, recommendation for organization is to make tasks ad impotent when possible. Uh, tasks will fail. Um, you cannot stop tasks from failing. They will fail in creative ways that you didn't expect. It's a very easy fix to say, just run that task over again, rather than to say, oh, well, we were in some unknown state halfway through the task, so we have to patch that up, try to manually you know, get it to the end result. Um, it's not always possible, of course, because you may have database uh, writes that are not replicable. You may have writes to your third-party services. But when you can, idempotence will save you grief. So let's talk about task distribution. Uh, every third-party service you're going to work with is going to have pagination of some kind when you're retrieving a list of resources. And pages are very logical places to break up your tasks because they're essentially uh, instances of a for loop. You're doing the same thing over and over again. That says to me, distribution. So the strategy is different dependent on whether you have access to limit offset uh, through the third party or whether you're dealing with a cursor that you get you know, a value of a cursor for each page and you call it with the next value of the cursor. Um, sometimes you don't even know the total size of the set you're working with, so that can change your strategy as well. So provided that you have the best case where you have limit offset and you know your set size, then the easiest way to handle pagination is to uh, have a dispatcher task that instantly dispatches every single page that it's going to need um, to you know, however big your set size is. Uh, and so you get 100, 1,000, 10,000, whatever tasks dumped on the queue at the same time. The workers churn through them furiously fast. And provided that you don't hit rate limits, you get really fast uh, import of large number of objects from a third party. That is very little code. This is the dispatcher that just goes through the range of offsets and launches pages. So let's say that you do not have limit offset um, support, in which case uh, whether you know the set size is irrelevant because you can't launch page two until you've done page one, because page one includes the cursor value you used to launch page two. So it still makes sense to uh, do this in separate tasks because you get to save uh, the bit of work you know, uh, from page to page, but you can't run them in parallel. That will look something like this, where there is no dispatcher. The task itself dispatches the next page, and you start out with the cur default cursor value of uh, you know, whatever zero, um, whatever the first one is. And you look for a sentinel cursor value that tells you you're done. You launch uh, one page after another um, and uh, yeah, until you get to the end. So let's say you do have limit offset, but you don't know your set size. Um, this is the case for, I believe, LinkedIn actually lies about the number of friends over a certain amount uh, and things like that. So um, you create a dispatcher task. You determine how many concurrent pages you want to launch at the same time. 
Uh, and then you have one page leapfrog its other concurrent pages and request the next in the set. So page one will request page four, page two, page five, on and on, until you get to page six over there, which doesn't have any results. And so it says, there are no more pages. I'm going to stop requesting more pages. Um, the downside to this is you make API calls you don't have to because pages seven and eight could have been skipped if you ran them all uh, as the previous example, one page launching another. The upside is you get the parallelization in your distribution uh, multiple pages at once. Um, so the dispatcher for that method uh, looks something like this. You set a number of concurrent pages and uh, for each of those in the range you uh, launch a single page uh, and then from within that page's task it uh, looks for results. If there are results in that page, it then increments itself by the number of concurrent pages and launches that next page. Pagination is not a science, it is an art. You will find, um, based on uh, uh, varying degrees of variance and re uh, response times from social networks, um, that sometimes a social network will say, like Facebook will say, I can support 5,000 of these per page, and they'll time out if you ask for any more than 3,000, for instance. Sometimes you're bottlenecked on your database rights, and so you can't actually finish uh, a page of results in a good amount of time. Um, your goal here is to minimize the number of API calls over the set of pages, but you may have to make your page size smaller than the maximum in order to get tasks done in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and uh, remember, um, you need to minimize the state in your task definitions, so it's a very bad idea to say um, request all of a uh, person's friends uh, in, in a single uh, task and then just pass off thousands of friends in messages to other workers because you'll get megabytes of uh, message sizes that have to live in memory in Rabbit and you'll eat up your memory, memory real fast. Rabbit's a little bit better about that these days, but there was a time not too long ago when Rabbit would just flat out like hard crash if you ran a memory. No warning, no nothing, just <laughs> everything's gone. That's bad. Um, you want to set a timeout uh, on your task. Celery gives you a way to set a soft timeout and a hard timeout um, so that uh, you can uh, deploy code easily um, so that you make sure that you know when you have long running tasks and you can go and fix that. And it's, it's a problem that you know, you know about so you can solve. Uh, so um, another problem with uh, task distribution is dependency. When you have tasks launching tasks launching tasks, it's very hard to answer the question, am I done with this set of work? Um, because you have this dependency graph, and it could be a very complex graph depending on how your tasks are structured. Uh, so luckily, Celery 3, if you haven't checked out Celery 3 yet, a major version released not too long ago, it has a lot of good features. One feature it has built in uh, is this dependency graph tracking. When a task launches a task, um, that child task says, uh, okay, this is my parent task. That gets serialized into the results store, uh, and um, so you can ask for the full graph of tasks if, they're, if they've been built. Uh, and if not, it'll raise an exception, and you know you haven't built out your full graph yet. Uh, and then you can go through and check the results state of each of those tasks to get an answer to, am I done yet? Um, so this requires that you don't ignore the results, because otherwise there won't be anything in the results store. And um, re-emphasizing, do not use RabbitMQ as your result backend. Uh, if any of you take anything from this presentation, it's do not use RabbitMQ as your result store backend. Please don't. Uh, so now let's talk a bit about rate limiting. Um, problems with rate limiting, well, the first problem is that Celery's rate limit feature probably doesn't do what you think it does unless you've actually you know, looked at it and, and used it directly. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, third party rate limits depend on many different factors. They, they can be unpredictable, they can be complex. Uh, you have to be able to deal with all of those factors if you want to respect third party rate limits. So we've got a little sample task here. It's as simple as I could possibly make it. And it's rate limited to uh, run once per hour. Uh, and it's important that it only run once per hour. Um, and so uh, I'm going to now do a live demonstration to show you how Celery will handle this uh, rate limit. So uh, the same things that I just mentioned. Uh, it doesn't work uh, with multiple worker daemons. Um, it, it doesn't uh, maintain its state between daemon restarts. 
Um, luckily, our rate limits we're wanting to deal with are actually uh, enforced by the third party, so we only have to make sure we're respecting their rate limits. We don't have to enforce our own. Uh, and the net net is you want to use your own external centralized store for rate limiting when doing tasks and not Celery's built-in support. Um, Redis is really good at this. It has a lot of data types that we can use. Um, the factors can vary based on who's asking, uh, what feature they're asking for, whether it's public or private information, all kinds of other unknowns. Um, the best case scenario is that all these are published. The reality is even when they're published, they're usually not consistent. Um, so here's just an example of two calls to the Twitter API. Uh, the first one is just getting your profile settings. You can see it gives you a rate limit class. These are all HTTP headers, by the way. Um, it gives you a class of API identified a certain rate limit and a time when that rate gets reset. You call uh, the same API but a different endpoint, the search endpoint, and you see these uh, feature rate limit class for user search has a completely different rate limit and a completely different reset time. Um, and uh, Twitter's actually gonna be rolling out more of this with 1.1, uh, and so you need to be able to react dyna dynamically to these rate limits based on the factors that they uh, depend on. Uh, so there are a few strategies here. When you have known rate limits with a fixed time window like the one I just showed you, which means that you have 350 calls per hour, and at this Unix timestamp, you get your new set of calls, um, there is a simple way to deal with it, which is you just keep calling things until you hit the rate limit. Uh, once you hit the rate limit, you inspect the headers to say, when do I get more calls? You stick that timestamp into Redis, everybody looks for it, uh, and they delay themselves until you get your new batch of calls. Uh, if you need to answer to the user, how many calls do I have left this hour? That's a little bit harder, and you have to use a counter and either increment uh, from zero or a decrement from your uh, initial rate limit uh, until that timestamp passes and then you can reset it. So we're gonna show you the simple solution, which is just see if the Redis key exists. Um, if it does, pull the timestamp out, subtract from now, and retry with the countdown equal to the difference so that you won't retry until you get your new batch of tasks. Um, if, uh, yeah, if you don't see the key, then you try the call. If you get a rate limit exception, then um, presumably your client is nice enough to tell you when you are getting uh, more calls, but if not, you need a better client. Uh, and then you, uh, same thing, you just figure out how long it is in the future and do a retry with the countdown until that happens. Uh, if you know your rate limit, but you have a rolling time window, for instance, like 25 calls every two hours, uh, which incidentally is Facebook's unpublished rate limit for wall-to-wall -wall posts, <clears throat> uh, you uh, can use a Redis sorted set of timestamps uh, and remove any stale ones from the end, uh, or from the beginning, that is. Uh, check the length, and if the length is less than your max number of requests within that window, you're free to make another request. Otherwise, uh, you have to wait until the oldest one would have dropped off the window in order to make more requests. So that essentially looks like, there we go, like this, uh, where you uh, have your, your window, uh, you have your expiration time based on the current time minus that window. Um, uh, this all Z, rem, range, whatever, um, that's all Redis uh, sorted set functions. Um, they're really useful, so you just chop off all the instances of the set whose score is lower than the expires time, and then you do a Z card to find out how many there are in the set. Uh, if there are less than your max, you're free to make another call, and you add yourself to the end. Um, with the current uh, time value. Otherwise, you determine what time uh, stamp the first one has. Uh, you determine how long that is uh, in the future for it to roll off the expires window, and you retry with that uh, countdown value. So if you don't know the limit, uh, rate limit at all, you have to be reactive instead of proactive um, using something Google calls exponential back off, uh, which means that once you hit the rate limit, then um, you start incrementing a counter that acts as an exponent to the number of seconds that you should wait to retry. Uh, so you're hammering Google or whoever really hard at first. They start to rate limit you, and you back off by 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 seconds uh, until you reach a maximum ceiling. Uh, and then once you start to get through again, you can either chop off your, uh, your counter and go back to zero and open up the pipe instantly, or you can gradually decrement your exponent counter and you know, kind of soft go back into it, which you employ depends on well, how nice you want to be and um, what they'll let you get away with, honestly. So an implementation of that uh, is uh, here. You get your exponent. 
Uh, if there's not an exponent or if it's zero, you go ahead and make your call. Otherwise, you retry with two to the back off exponent seconds. Uh, if you try to make your call and you get rate limited, then you increment this key and uh, you do the exact same retry. Um, you'll see a common pattern here is if you have already been rate limited, you implement your strategy. Otherwise, you try to make the call. If you get rate limited there, you implement the same exact strategy. So let's talk about failover. Um, unfortunately, we've been using countdown a lot here for failover with retries, but even countdown doesn't do uh, exactly what you would expect with Celery. Uh, and third parties can, again, fail in lots of interesting ways, so you have to make sure your failover strategy is really solid, really tight. Um, gosh, I keep losing connection here. All right. So I would love to give you another code demonstration here, but my presentation is already really long, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, suffice to say, um, tasks are immediately dispatched to uh, a worker daemon on retry. Um, they're serialized with an ETA of when it's safe to actually try that task again. The worker uh, daemon hangs onto it in memory until that ETA is passed. It does some uh, internal prioritization to determine when it should retry the task, and then it retries the task. Um, you would think that you could lose the work this way, except that Celery tries really hard to make sure you don't on a soft shutdown, and Rabbit uh, has an acknowledgment feature, so the worker doesn't acknowledge um, that it's working the task until it is actually working the task, which saves you from losing work, even if you were to kill Dash 9, uh, your Celery uh, worker daemon. Um, but this is still a very suboptimal solution uh, because you have workers hanging on to tasks that should be in the queue. Uh, and so your centralization, or your decentralization strategy, your distribution strategy is totally thrown out of whack because you could have one worker daemon that has a whole bunch that is waiting to work and another that's starved for tasks at the same time. And uh, you just, this is not a good solution. So the solution to this that I've uh, come up with, uh, uh, inspired by, um, uh, there's a, a guy who wrote a blog post on this, uh, is a dead letter exchange is an extension of AMQP that you can employ to fake this kind of ETA support that Rabbit itself is missing. Um, so uh, you have uh, exchanges in AMQP that um, queues bind to with routing keys. And so you have a message that, uh, that reaches an exchange, uh, and then it has a routing key in the message. The exchange says, what queues do I have that match this routing key? Uh, I'm going to send a message to all of those queues, and then the queue can do what it wants to as far as consumers pulling off of it. In this case, we define an ad hoc queue um, with our default routing key, but in a separate exchange. That queue has a TTL with the amount of time that we want to wait for that task before it gets actually put into the main queue. Um, in just an example, 60 seconds. And then we set this property on the queue called dead letter exchange to tell it what exchange to dump the message into after that TTL uh, has passed. We don't hook any workers up to this queue. There are no consumers, so all the messages stay in the queue for the full TTL. They expire, and when they expire, they get dumped into this other exchange here, uh, which is our normal Celery exchange. Um, has the same routing key bound to our default queue with workers uh, consuming from it. And so at the end of the TTL, it goes through the normal process, gets consumed by a worker just as if it were newly sent. But all this time, the message exists on your RabbitMQ uh, server, uh, not in your workers. Uh, and so um, this is a, a snippet from uh, an overridden uh, apply async function from a task subclass uh, that dynamically uh, tells Celery about a queue that it's creating with these queue arguments of message TTL and dead letter exchange. You also see this X expires here. Um, that basically ensures that the queue um, disappears after uh, that number of seconds because we don't actually want to keep all these queues around. We just want them temporarily for the purpose of dead letter exchange. So then you update your routing options by telling it, uh, route it to my countdown exchange with this new queue I've just created. Uh, and then Celery will dump it into the countdown exchange. Uh, it'll get routed to your queue. It'll sit there for your TTL, which is your countdown value, and then get dumped into the normal Celery process. Uh, so that is the alternative to uh, using Celery's built-in countdown. Um, I hope to convince Ask that this is worthy of putting in uh, Celery itself. Um, so, uh, again, third parties can fail in lots of interesting ways. Um, so you want to um, figure out all of your edge cases and weird things that only happen once in a blue moon, uh, wrap all of those up into a centralized function, uh, stick it in a task-based class, and use that base class 
uh, for all of your subclasses that use that same social network or third party um, to make those calls. Uh, this can include uh, retry functionality. It can include you know, exception handling, all the things that make it really hard to uh, wrap up your task nicely and neatly and make sure that it gets done or retried. Um, you want to handle within a single function. All right, so dealing with multiple queues. Uh, why would you want multiple queues? Well, um, you get better control over the priority of tasks if you segment your queue by task type or by you know, priority, that sort of thing. Um, you can allow for spikes much better because you can distribute your resources however you want to. Uh, you can launch worker daemon pools that only consume from certain queues rather than all the queues. Uh, and so you have many, many more routing options available to you if you use multiple queues for different purposes. Um, another interesting use case is what I call a trickle queue, which is when you have really low priority work, but maybe a large volume of it that needs to be done over a long period of time. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in just a second. It's really easy to implement multiple queues in Celery. Uh, it's just a setting in your settings.py. Uh, you define the queue name and the binding key. Uh, you can get deeper into this if you actually want to use the combo queue object um, under the covers in, in the AMQP uh, implementation, but you don't have to. Uh, and then you just launch your Celery worker daemon uh, with your queues argument. Um, I think by default it uses all the queues, but it's always better to be explicit. Uh, so you can tell this worker pool, use this queue, this worker pool, use all the queues, and you know, manage it however you want to. So back to the trickle queue. Um, so let's say you want to do something like um, keep the avatars fresh for all of your you know, users that had Twitter accounts connected. Uh, you want to do this for, say, hundreds of thousands of users, um, but you don't want to starve the other things in your queue. So you set up a cron job. Um, you have a cursor persisted somewhere, like Redis or in your database or something that says, this is where I last left off. Um, it's been a minute. You know, just put five or 10 more in the queue and work them. It's very low priority, but if you dump all of them at once into your queue, then you're going to starve uh, everything else that wants to use that same priority queue. Uh, and um, so let's say you had Facebook people who uh, avatars you wanted to update as well. You dump 100,000 Twitter jobs in this queue. It takes days and days and days to work. And now your Facebook users have days uh, old, stale avatars because you starved one task in favor of another, making implicit priority where you should have been uh, having them, uh, equal priority uh, by trickling them into the queue. So I mentioned a cron job just now to uh, implement this trickle queue. Um, this is another one of my strong opinions. Uh, I think Celery Beat is uh, a re-implementation of the cron wheel that doesn't need to exist. Uh, so um, don't, <laughs> don't use it. It has problems. Um, one of those problems is that uh, it uses a persistence layer, either the file system or the database, to keep track of your periodic tasks. That can get out of sync with your tasks, especially if you delete tasks and the record is still in the database. Um, Celery Beat will try to launch tasks that don't exist and then will yell at you. Um, this is bad. Uh, it's just one more process to manage. Who wants to manage another process unless you're an ops guy and your job is managing processes? Uh, but I'm not. I don't like managing processes. So I like the fact that everyone in the world uses cron, and it's really just not that hard. Um, there's no need to uh, make a reinvention of it. There's no need to re-implement it uh, in a way that you know, could have bugs. Um, less code is good, right? So just use cron, don't use Celery Beat. Um, there's probably not actually time left, but uh, I'm going to pretend that there is for the sake of this meetup and go right into debugging. Um, just a few tips. Um, when you're debugging locally, go through the effort to set up Rabbit, um, Redis, uh, set up your worker daemons, all of this stuff. Um, I know it's antithetical to the run server way of doing things in Django local development, but you really don't want to use always eager um, to run your tasks synchronously when you're developing locally. Uh, a lot of these strategies have tasks launching tasks, the dependency tree that I mentioned. Uh, if you have like a big network that you're importing locally, you're going to exceed your maximum recursion depth. Um, you're going to do other nasty things like um, incidentally launch a task that takes a long time to get all worked out. Uh, and you're waiting for your local web page to load for minutes and minutes and minutes while it's running in the background doing this thing synchronously. That's not really designed to be done synchronously. And it's always better to be as close to production as possible when you're working in your local environment because things work more like production that way. Um, so given that you have given up synchronous running of tasks, uh, you now have debugging issues because problems are harder to track down. You can't easily just set a breakpoint, although you, you, you can set a breakpoint in Celery Workers, but that's 
another problem. Um, so logging is the answer to these issues, and it's good for production as well as uh, your local environment. Um, add more logging, info level logging doesn't get caught by default, so you can specify log level in info on your worker daemon pools, um, but logging is really the, uh, the central tool that you have to debugging a um, distributed system. And third, when you're working with third-party dependencies, unit tests are good, but you really want a suite of integration tests as well. Um, there's an idea that you should never be mocking anything that is outside of your control that you don't control the API for. Uh, and you don't control the API for third parties, but you mock them anyway, and I do too, because it saves time in your test suite, and you don't actually want to make those calls to live servers. I understand uh, it's completely reasonable, but you're not actually testing the full loop until you have integration tests that actually go out and hit those live servers and third parties and make sure that the API that you coded against is actually the API that still exists um, or you know, any number of other things that might have changed because you're mocking out these third party calls. A few gotchas. Um, this is just a basic Python thing. But if you're using C-level blocking like sockets, uh, then nothing else is going to be able to interrupt your code. Uh, the soft timeout that Celery provides as a feature uh, won't, actually, um, uh, won't actually fire. You'll get to the hard timeout, which is you know, just like a hard process kill, and you'll lose workers, and bad things will happen, and you won't know why. So the easy solution for third-party interfaces in particular is just to set a timeout on all of your socket calls. Make sure um, when you're using client libraries, most of them support timeout. Again, if they don't, then you should probably consider using a different library. Um, but make sure that you implement that always. Uh, soft timeout doesn't automatically retry a task. Uh, it doesn't know whether it should or not. So you really need to be um, trying and catching that soft timeout if you are implementing a soft timeout, which I recommend, uh, to make sure that um, you're retrying if you hit it. Uh, because you know most of the time, it's due to just uh, a network being slow, your database being slow, something being slow that's ephemeral and it's going to go away. So you might as well retry that task. Um, Another thing, and this is an odd design choice on Celery's part, is the default task result state is pending. So um, even if Celery has no record of that result whatsoever, uh, either it's expired from cache or you've deleted it from the database or whatever, um, Celery will tell you it's pending. Uh, this is not very useful, but if you know about it, you know, it's, it's OK. Um, just know that you know, if you set a cache expire time on your results and you get pending back as an answer, it's not because it didn't complete. It's probably because it either completed or failed and then got deleted from your results store. And Celery is just being uh, helpful and telling you pending. So that is uh, about it. <laughs>